In this video, I'll be showing you 10 concepts for structural design of columns. This is going to be an ultimate guide to column design. Let's jump inside the video. Hello and welcome to Civil Black Box. If you're new to this channel, do consider subscribing. And if by the end of this video, you get some value out of it, please do not forget to hit that like button. It really, really helps with the motivation as well as the YouTube algorithm. With that said, let's jump inside the 10 concepts for column design. So let's start with concept number one, which is going to be the types of loads and the load combinations which are to be considered for the structural design of columns. When it comes to the types of loads, we are working with dead loads, the live loads, wind loads, and the seismic loads. If you need more information as to how these loads are to be calculated, please hit me up in the comments. In general, these are going to be the four major types of loads with respect to IS-456 for which we'll be designing our columns. Now, when it comes to the combination types, this will primarily depend upon a few things. For example, it will depend upon whether we are designing our columns for ultimate loads or the failure conditions or with respect to the strength criteria or whether we are doing it with respect to the serviceability criteria. Now, both these criteria come from the IS-456, which is the plain and reinforced concrete code. This is the Indian standard code. Again, there is one more case for which the combination types differ. That comes for the proportioning part, but this is with respect to just the foundations. So we are not going to be too much interested in the foundation part. We'll be interested in the ultimate strength and the serviceability conditions, which are going to be coming from IS-456. So when it comes to columns, this is where we are going to be interested in. That being said, I have created an entire video on load combinations. Do check that out. The link should pop up somewhere on the screen right now and should also be there down in the description below. This is going to be concept number one. Let's move on to concept number two, which is going to build upon the concept number one, which is all about live load reduction. Now, when it comes to the live loads or rather the load types, live loads is where columns differ from slabs and beams because this is where we have to reduce those live loads. Now, the reduction of live load comes from the Indian Standard Code IS 875 Part 2. This is clause number 3.2, which says that reductions in total imposed loads on floors may be made in designing columns. So whenever we are designing columns, we can at the end of the day make some reductions. Now, the reduction will depend upon the number of floors, including the roof, which is being carried by the member under consideration and it will also depend upon what reduction is there. So if the floor is carrying just one floor above it, there is going to be no reduction. However, if a floor is carrying two floors above it, there is going to be a reduction of 10% and so on and so forth. Now, if you want a more detailed version or a more detailed video on just the live load or a reduction of live loads with respect to columns, do hit me up in the comments and I'll try to make a video on that. So this is all about live load reduction. Let's move on to the concept number three, which is going to be the load transfer mechanism. And while talking about the load transfer mechanism, I'll be taking you inside a StatPro model. So this is a simple StatPro model, which I've created. Now, what is going on here is that we have one, two, three, four, and five floors, or rather five floor plates. I have given it simple properties like 0.3 and 0.3. So all the members are defined with a 300 by 300 square size. When it comes to the materials, you are working with concrete. So everything is going to be default. I've done nothing special here. When it comes to loading, however, I have done, I, or rather I have provided a floor load value of 10. So if you can see, we have a value of minus 10. If I just double click on it, you can see we are working with a pressure value of minus 10 kN per meter square. So each of this slab is taking up a load of minus 10. Now, why I'm telling you this is we need to understand the flow or the transfer of loads with respect to the entire structure. Now I'll bring you back to the geometry so that it's much easier to comprehend. The floor which you see right here is taking up a lot many loads. So this is taking up a lot many loads and these loads at the end of the day get transferred on to these beams. So this beam right here, this beam right here, this beam right here and this beam right here. So all the loads which were on the slab get transferred on to these that is something like this, which at the end of the day, get transferred on to the columns. So this entire load gets 
divided into four parts, something like this. So if I'll just be able to make it. So in a triangular fashion, it gets divided into four parts with each part giving its load on the columns. Now what happens next is for each load which comes on this beam, this beam, this beam, and this beam gets transferred on to these columns. A similar scenario will be for the beam at the lower levels. This will also get transferred down. However, the loads which were coming from the top also get transferred down. Next up, we get three load cases moving down and so on and so forth. And I can prove that by simply going into the post-processing mode and checking it out. But before that, let's have a look at what these values are. So if I'll just double click on it, or rather if I just find the node to node distance, you can see this is four meters and this is again four meters. So we have a 16 meter square floor multiplied by 10 kilo Newton per meter square value, which gives us a total load of 160 kilo Newton per floor. So the total load per floor is going to be 160 kilo Newton. And this is going to be the same for all the floors. Same for right here and same for right here and same for right here. Now I'm telling you this just because of the fact that we saw that this 160 is going to be divided equally along the four beams, which will ultimately be transferred onto the columns. So ideally, if we were trying to understand it, we can safely assume that if this is going to be 160, around one fourth of this load is going to be transferred onto this column. That is 40 is going to be transferred here, 40 is going to be transferred here, 40 right here, and 40 right here. Similarly, when we go a bit down, again, we have a 160, which again gets transferred to 40, 40, this one 40, and this column 40. But this top one is also coming, so this one becomes 40 plus 40, and 40 plus 40, and 40 plus 40, and so on. So this is what we are going to expect. That is, just looking at this column, for example, we'll get a 40, that is 160 divided by 4 from this. This one will be 40 plus 40, that is 40 from this and 40 from the above floor. This one will be 40 plus 40 plus 40 and so on and so forth. This one will be 40 plus 40 plus 40 plus 40. And finally, we'll be getting 40 plus 40 plus 40 plus 40 plus 40. So this is what we should be getting. So this becomes 40, this is 80, this is going to be 120, 160 and 200. So this is what we are going to be expecting. Let's go ahead inside the post processing and check it out. I've already run the analysis. So all I did was went into the analysis, created an analysis command of all, went ahead and ran the analysis. So I've already run the analysis. So if I go inside the workflow and inside the post processing, I just have one load case. Right here, I'm inside the displacements. What I need is to have a look at the beam results. So if I just go inside beam results, and if I just click on any of these columns here and move right here, you can see I have the FX value for this as 40. And if I move down, this is going to be an FX value of 80, which we anticipated. This one is going to be 120. This one is going to be 160. And this one is going to be 200. In fact, you can see that by just clicking on this graph where we just look at FX and get rid of FY. So you can see the values uh, of the FX are increasing from top to bottom. Everything is getting increased in sort of a very straightforward manner. This one being 40, this one being 80, this one being 120, 160, and 200. This also tells me that the columns at the base take up much more load than the columns at the top. And that is going to be our point number four. That is, we have stronger columns at the base. This again comes from this exact figure that the columns moving downwards take up loads from all the above floors, which is not true for beams. So beams are only going to be taking the loads for this slab right here. So if I were to just look at one of these beams and have a look at the FY value, which is going to be this direction. So you can see we are getting a value of 20, which is coming from basically 40 divided by two. So this is going to be 40. So we had 160 that got divided into four parts. So each part got 40 kilonewton value. 
So we are getting a 40 kilo Newton right here, which gets divided into two parts right here, which is 20 and 20 right here. So this will hold true for all the beams if I were to have a look at it. So if let's just have a look at it quickly. So if I just select this beam and look at its FY value, you can see we are getting a, again a 20, this one again a 20, and this one again a 20. And this will not differ if I go down. So you can see we are again getting the 20 values right here for the FY. And this also tells me that the beams are only taking the loads for that level. However, columns are getting loads in a cumulative manner, which is moving down, which brings us back to our fourth concept, which is going to be stronger columns at the base. Let's move on to the fifth concept, which is all about having stronger columns and weak beams. Now this logic comes from IS 13920, 2016 version which talks about the strong column and weak beam requirement. Now I won't go into why this happens. If you want more details about why this is being done, do hit me up in the comments. I'll try and make a video on it. All in all, as per IS13920, the values for the columns or the moments for the columns are taken at 1.4 times the value of the beams. This gives us or rather the structural designer, the ability to by default design a stronger column because we are working with a 1.4 factor rather than working with a simple one factor. So we are ultimately over designing our columns with respect to beams. And again, this comes from IS 13920 2016 version. Let's move on to the concept number six as to when should we be using IS 13920. And that comes into picture with respect to IS1 through 920 itself, from which if you look at clause 1.1.1, which says that for seismic zone 2, you have the option of not using IS13920 at all. So for seismic zone 2, this is going to be optional. However, for seismic zone 3, seismic zone 4, and seismic zone 5, you have to mandatorily use IS13920. And with respect to what these zones are, you can go inside IS-13893 and look at the chart, which clearly indicates which zones are which. For example, right here, the blue ones are going to be zone number two. So if I were to look at this zone number two, this is going to be all the blue ones which you see. With respect to zone number three, which is going to be yellow. So zone number three is going to be all these yellows, wherever you see it, this is going to be the zone number three. Zone number four is going to be these greens. So every green portion which you see is going to be our zone number four. And zone number five is going to be everything which is on orange. So right here, right here, right here, and all these locations. So these are going to be our zone number five. For these cases, we are going to be mandatorily use 13920, IS 13920. However, for seismic zone two, that is an option. Moving on to the concept number seven, which is all about the column size. When it comes to column size, there are four key parameters based upon which we decide the column size. The first one is the minimum size itself. Now the minimum size comes from IS13920 clause 7.1.1, which says that the minimum dimension of your column shall not be less than 300 or 20 times dB, where dB is going to be the dia of the longitudinal reinforcement bar in the beam. So whatever beam is running through this columns, for example, if this is a column and this is a beam, and if there is a beam, uh, a longitudinal reinforcement running right here with a dimension of say dB, this minimum dimension cannot be greater than or cannot be rather less than 20 times of this dB. Again, dB is going to be the largest diameter of the longitudinal reinforcement. Also, this cannot be less than 300 mm. So these are the two criteria. Now, if we have to look at the first criteria in a bit more detail, it simply boils down to this table, where if we define the dB, that is the largest dia of the longitudinal rebar for the beam, if it were 12, so if the beam with which the column is connected has a dia of 12, we can go up to 20 dB, that is 240 is our minimum. But since as per IS13920, we have to take a minimum of 300, this becomes 300 by default. For 16, we have to go up to 320. We cannot work with 300. So if a beam has a 16 dia rebar or the maximum dia of the rebar is 
16, we cannot simply choose the 300 mm size of column. We have to go for 320 and so on and so forth. For 20, we have to go with 400, 25, 500, 32, 640. Next up, we have the structural loads. Now, if the structural loads go up, obviously the column size will ultimately go up. With respect to grade, we have two factors related to it. If the structural loads go up, the grade of concrete has to be increased if you want to keep the sizes the same. So the column size will ultimately depend upon the grade of concrete. If we choose a higher grade of concrete, the column sizes go down and vice versa. It also depends upon the exposure conditions. So the grade of concrete will at the end of the day be dependent upon the exposure conditions. So for a mild exposure condition, we can use a minimum grade of concrete of M20. However, for say an extreme exposure condition, we cannot go below M40. So if we are choosing a grade and that grade depends upon the exposure and the grade depends or rather affects the size of the column, all of these are interdependent. Last but not the least, it is all about concrete and steel balance. Now, when it comes to the RCC design itself, this concept is very important that concrete and steel play kind of a seesaw together. So if I were to increase the concrete, the steel portion would go down. So if you increase the sizes of the members to a specific limit, of, of course, the steel can be taken down because the strength will be acquired by the concrete or taken up by the concrete rather than by the steel and vice versa. So if you increase the steel again to a specific limit, the concrete can be reduced. At the end of the day, we play with balances. So concrete and steel should be in some kind of balance, both in terms of the strength, in terms of the aesthetics and in terms of the economy. So this was point number seven or the concept number seven. Let's move on to the concept number eight, which is going to be about the column shape. Now the column shape will depend upon the condition whether the load that is being applied is a pure axial load or it is an eccentric load. Now pure axial loads do not come easily. So this is kind of a theoretical case. So for pure axial, we can work with symmetrical sizes or rather symmetrical shapes. So we can work with squares and we can work with circles. However, when it comes to the eccentric load, which is going to be the usual case, we'll be working with some kind of a rectangle where one dimension is greater than the other, just to take up that eccentricity, take up that, those moments. Building upon that, concept number nine is going to be the column orientation itself. Now, the column orientation whether it is inclined something like this or whether it is inclined something like this will depend upon the load distribution and it will also depend upon the entire plan. So if this were the plan of our structure, so we, we are looking at our structure from the top and these are the column locations. And if you're working with values like wind loads and seismic loads, where those loads tend to work in both these directions, we can feel or rather have a feel of this entire structure that the moment of inertia is going to be lesser along this axis than along this axis. Again, this will depend upon the DQ factor, if you remember. If you don't, please hit me up in the comments. I'll try and make a video on that too. But you get a general sense that if I were to try to rotate my structure along this direction, it is going to be much easier to rotate it. And hence, we need a bit more stiffness in this direction, which can only occur if I increase the column dimensions along this side. So the better solution in this case will be to increase the column dimensions along this side and hence the column orientation in again a general case for such a layout would be something like this. Now if I were to move this in a different direction, the column orientations will again of course differ and it will be along the other side because the moment of inertia has to be increased on the other side just to resist the earthquake loads and the wind loads for that axis. That's all about the column orientation. Let's move on to the final concept, which is going to be the column reinforcement. Now this comes from IS 456 clause 26.5.3, where we have been defined the minimum and the maximum reinforcements. So the minimum reinforcement with respect to IS 456 comes out to be 0.8% and the maximum comes out to two values. So it's mentioned in the IS 456 that we can choose a value not more than 6%. However, in the note is it is mentioned that the use of 6% reinforcement may involve practical difficulties in placing and compacting of the concrete. Hence, lower percentage is recommended. So it is also mentioned that where bars 
have to be lapped with those in the column under consideration, the percentage shall usually not exceed 4%. So in most of the cases, when we, were, when we are working with IS-456 and we are working with lap joints, that is one joint placed over the other in a lap fashion, we are going to be working with a maximum percentage of steel of 4%. However, if you're working with couplers or mechanical couplers, we can go up to 6% maximum steel. Next concept is the number of longitudinal bars which you can provide. So for a rectangular column, you can have a minimum number of rebars as four. However, that for circular columns is going to be six. So you have to provide at least four bars for the rectangular column and at least six bars for the circular columns. Now the dia of these will depend upon, of course, the design, but it is again limited or a minimum value is provided that the minimum dia of either of these bars can be 12 mm. So you cannot go under 12. That is, you cannot use 10 mm dia bars or 8 mm dia bars for columns. So you have to go with 12 mm. So these are all the 10 concepts for structural design of columns. I'll just reiterate them for you. So the first one was the different types of loads and the load combinations. We have to work with live load reduction when it comes to columns. We have to understand the load transfer mechanism, how the loads flow from top to bottom in a cumulative manner, which gives us the fourth point, that is we have stronger columns at the base because they are taking up more loads. We are also working with IS-13920, which defines that we have to work with or create stronger columns and weaker beams. We also have to understand when to use IS-13920 so that we know whether we are to work with stronger columns or not. We also need to understand the column sizes, what are the minimum sizes, how they depend upon the diameter of the beams. We have the column shapes, whether we have to use a circular column, a rectangular column, a square column, depending upon the different conditions, the column orientation, how the columns are oriented with respect to the plans, and finally, what are going to be the column reinforcements. So these were the 10 concepts with respect to the structural design of columns. If you like them, please hit that like button. It really, really helps with the motivation. If you have any more video suggestions, please hit me up in the comments. Thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one.